Hey everybody, and welcome to my first of like five or more videos on the Pentax KS2. This is a digital single lens reflex camera. It has a multi, so, so what that means is it has a single lens on the front and the light for your image comes in through the lens. When you look through the optical viewfinder, it's bouncing off a mirror and into a prism and then out the viewfinder. When you take a picture, the mirror pops up and then the light goes straight to the sensor. This has a multi-mode meter. And what that means is the meter has three modes. There's one where it looks at the entire image and determines the best exposure based on the entire image. There's one where it uses just the center area to calculate 60% of the exposure and then 40% or 75, 25, I'm not actually sure what the split is on this camera. But the center part portion of the image contains a greater amount of the metering data for the, for the image. And then the third one is called spot metering, which is where the center of the image is 100% of the metering data. This has shutter speeds of 30 seconds to 1 6,000th of a second. The viewfinder magnifies at 0.95x and covers 100% of the frame. What that means is that the image in the viewfinder is 95% of the size that it will be on the sensor and that what you see in the frame is 100% of what will be in the final image. It has an interchangeable focusing screen with uh, the standard which includes framing brackets but there are other options such as a grid focusing screen which i'm a huge fan of and a few others and i don't know all of them or any of the others actually and this has a flash sync which is 1 180th of a second this camera is targeted at the entry level user market it's a very user oriented camera in terms of the interface, it's very simple to understand, very quick to learn, and very easy to use. And it doesn't have all the intimidating buttons and dials that an advanced level camera will have. Just a nice set of interface elements that allow you to get around the menu system and choose a lot of common functions quickly. The in-camera shake reduction is good for up to three stops of shake reduction on the professional level or advanced level DSLRs from Pentax, that's four to four and a half. The KS2 has excellent build quality with complete weather sealing, including on the fold-out screen and the lens and on the lens mount. Now, it doesn't mean you can go scuba diving with your camera, but if you're caught out in a rain or a drizzle, it protects your camera against that, protects it against dust, atmospheric dust, things like that. The KS2 is produced by Ricoh Imaging under the brand uh, uh, name of Pentax. It's assembled and built in the Philippines and it was released in 2015, which is when this video was made, so the production is ongoing. The KS2 was pre preceded by the KS1 but I am told that the KS-1, that this is not a direct extension or replacement of the KS-1. It's a little bit KS-1, a little bit K-50 as well. It's got the weather sealing like the K-50. It's got a little bit of the spiffy interface and some of the, some of the lighted dials and things like the KS-1 had. Um, it is really a very innovative camera, and it seems like, to me, where Pentax is releasing a KS number, they're using the S cameras as sort of a playground to try out new functions such as Wi-Fi and a flip-out screen. It's being made concurrently with the 645Z, K3, K32, and whatever the full-frame camera is going to be called. And it's still in production, so we don't know yet what this will be followed by, but uh, whatever the KS3 is going to be in a couple of years, it will be a fantastic camera, I have no doubt. So if you have your KS2, let's take a look at what all of this stuff is, and we'll go over the features overview. 
in the subsequent videos we're going to talk about. So in this video we're going to look at all of these buttons and dials and talk about what they are. In the subsequent videos we're going to look at all these buttons and dials and talk about what they do. All right, so if you have your KS2, let's take a look at the features and buttons and dials on it. Here we have the top of the camera. And even the, and right here on the sides, we have the strap lugs. This is what your camera strap will attach to. This right here is the film plane indicator or in a digital camera, really, it's the digital sensor plane. And what that means is that where this line is, that's where your image is focused and where the sensor is in your camera. So if you're going to do something like macro photography where you need to take an exact measurement from the, from the film plane to your subject to calculate light loss, that tells you exactly where it is. This is the uh, pop-up flash and the button for it's on the side. We'll see that in just a minute. Here is, uh, here's the hot shoe and it's got a removable cover keep it protected when it's not in use. Here's the speaker so that when you play video on the camera there's a little speaker that you can hear the sound where it's coming from or and that's where the sound comes from. This little white line on the side right here is the um, shooting mode index and what that does is whatever of the dot modes on the um, mode selector dial here is next to the white line that's what mode you're going to be in and in, we have an entire video dedicated to uh, to things like shooting modes um, it's going to seem really daunting and intimidating because we're going to go through everything but realistically you won't use much uh, most of these cam the camera functions that we're going to cover in these videos once you settle into a style of shooting that you're comfortable with. This is the Wi-Fi shortcut button. The exposure compensation button is this little box with the plus and the minus. Here's the green button and this is a context button. We'll talk about that in a bit, like as in not this video. This is the on-off video index, this white line, and here's the off-on video selector dial. Here's the shutter release button and then right here is the front command wheel. Here we have the self timer light right here when the self timer is going or when you're in remote control mode and you are waiting to trigger the, uh, the re so this has two functions this light. As the self timer is counting down, it flashes and then flashes quickly when the self timer is almost done. If you're using a remote control, then this light will flash when the camera is not recording video or not taking a picture so that if you see it flashing, you know it's not doing anything. And that works because it's easier to see it than not see it. So if you're standing on the other side of a room or at one point I was recording video, I was about 50 feet away, I could see that the light was or was not flashing and know that I had to go over and get within 10 feet to trigger it with the remote. This right here is the lens release button and that's what you push down to rot rotate the lens and remove it. And we'll see a little bit more about lens use in the second video. This is the lens mount itself. Here's your autofocus screw and the contacts and the, the index dot. So when, when, you, when we look at the second video, you'll see how to use that dot to mount a lens. This is your autofocus manual focus switch right here on the front on the side. Above the autofocus manual focus is your raw FX button and your flash release button. Here on this side we have a microphone port so that if you're recording video you can put an external microphone in which was a huge shortcoming in the KS-1 and I am exceedingly glad that Pentax brought the microphone port back to this, this level camera or added it. I don't know if their other entry level ones had it or not but I'm glad to see that this entry level camera has a microphone port because it allows you as a photographer interested in doing some video 
to have better sound quality and allows the camera to grow with you as you explore doing video with your digital camera. Okay, so here on the camera's back, we have the live view button right over here. And what this does is when your camera's on and you have the screen flipped out, the live view button will take what's on the sensor and display it on the screen to allow you to do more accurate focusing. Uh, it's not great for quick focusing, but if you're doing a still life or a landscape or something, that's a really fantastic feature to have. Here we have the viewfinder. And if we take off the viewfinder surround that comes with the camera, this is the diopter correction slider. You can slide it left or to right to correct your diopter. Here we have the rear command wheel, and this is another, like the front command wheel, we have two, which is very nice to have. It's, it's actually a, a very close, it's having two command wheels makes this handle a lot more like an advanced level camera, especially in manual shooting mode. But we're, the KS-1 only had one command wheel, uh, if I remember correctly, and having two is extremely, extremely nice. I've used some uh, Canon and Nikon cameras, even that are a higher level than this one, that only have one command wheel, and they're just... Having two makes the interface a lot easier to manage and helps set you up to take really great photos. It's, it's fantastic to see that the entry-level model from Pentax now has the rear command wheel. Sorry, got off on a tangent there. Um, in addition to the rear command wheel, we have the AF-AEL button. Now that's autofocus and auto exposure lock. And what that can do, it, it's context sensitive. In the menu system, there's a few different options that you can assign to this, and we'll see that in the third video. Um, it's not something I use very often, but it's there to, it, this is another sort of advanced level feature and that, that appears on a lot of advanced level cameras. An entry level camera without it would be none the worse for it or for not having it. So, um, but I'll show you how to use that because it's it's an interesting little button with some some functions that are useful in some uh, circumstances. Here we have this little dot right here is a light, and when that light is on, it means your camera is writing an image file to your SD card. Um, that's the only function that that light has. Here's the play button. And so this is what you would push to go in and look at what pictures you've taken so far. Something sort of like this. Oh, look at that awesome picture of a hedge. And another awesome picture of a hedge. Oh, all these great pictures of hedges. Oh, that's just fantastic. Hedges galore. Really, those are all different pictures. Okay, and there's a tower. All right, that, now that's boring. Um, okay, now we have the command pad right here. This top button is the ISO button. This allows you to change your ISO or your ISO mode. So you can, if you set your ISO, your, your image sensitivity manually, you can do that by entering this menu. And we'll see this in the second video. And I'll talk about what, what the different functions behind this button do. The next button here is the drive mode button. And what this does is it changes the manner in which the camera shoots photos. So we'll look at this in the second video. We'll talk about what each of the drive modes does in general, but this is where you would switch it from single frame to, to continuous shooting to multi-exposure and different advanced shooting modes as well. WB is white balance. That's where you go to adjust the white balance. The lightning bolt here is your flash, and that's where you go to adjust your flash mode and the power. and Again, in the second video, we'll talk in depth about what's behind each of those buttons in terms of functionality. And then, okay, everything is okay when you push the okay button, right? Okay, I should stop drinking when I do these videos. Uh, menu, the menu button takes you into the menu, which allows you to customize and change all kinds of things. The entire third video is about the menu button. And then info gives you some various information and access to a quick mode selections uh, and changing screen and we'll talk about the info button in the second video I know there's a whole lot of punting things to later videos in this but these things are so in-depth that they require 
multiple videos so that this one video is not nine hours long. On this side of the camera here, we've got the HDMI port and USB port, so you can plug this to your computer to transfer photos, or you can plug it to a TV or tablet uh, or something else with an HDMI in and um, show a, a do a screen slideshow from your camera. Here is your SD card port. This is where you put your SD card to save all of your images. Then on the bottom, here we have your serial number. Whoa, your serial number, right? Whoa. <laughs> All right. Everything's going perfectly today. Uh, here you have your serial number. This is your tripod bushing. Some data about stuff. And then over here, this is where your battery goes. And we'll see in the second video how to change the battery, but it's really pretty simple, just like that. So this camera does have some special features. The first of them is that it has an electronic level, which is based on gravity, so it can be used even in zero light settings. It might not work in outer space. So if you're going into outer space, you should plan on not having an accurate level in this camera. The in-body stabilization on this camera works on any lens you can mount on it, and it will correct up to three stops, as I said, using 2014 shake reduction calculation methodology. Um, if you're using the kit lens or another advanced or current K-mount lens or a legacy K-mount or even an M42 with an adapter, the in-body stabilization will work. It has a pentaprism up here in the housing instead of a pentamir. Some of the other makers, entry-level cameras, use a pentamir. And a pentamir system is basically just some mirrors that direct the image from this reflex mirror up to the eyepiece. Mirrors do not retain as much light, so having a pentaprism makes the image in the viewfinder brighter than if it uses mirrors. It does add a little bit of weight, but it improves your ability to use the uh, optical viewfinder because the image coming through the viewfinder is brighter, sharper, and more accurate, and it's easier to see what's actually in focus. It has on-camera, or specifically in-camera, I guess, technically, since the Wi-Fi is not on top of the camera but is buried somewhere inside of it. It has, it has Wi-Fi. It has Wi-Fi built in. And uh, the Wi-Fi is controlled with this button or with a menu, and we'll see how to use that in the fifth video, which is all about using Wi-Fi with this camera. The, uh, on, the, the in-body Wi-Fi interfaces with an Android app. As of this video's recording, there's no iOS version of that app that I know of, um, but the Android app is really streamlined, easy to use, and I'll show you how to use the version of that app, which is live right now, uh, in the fifth video as well as how to use this Wi-Fi. Understanding that in the future, if you're watching this in nine years, I'm, I'm guessing that the app will have been updated. I sure as heck hope it will have been updated in that time. The KS2 is compatible with this little guy right here, the Astro Tracer unit, the OGPS. This is a uh, little GPS doohickey that attaches to your camera's hot shoe and communicates with the camera. And what it does is it uses your camera's gyroscopes and the uh, GPS coordinates so that you can mount your camera at an alignment, point it at some stars, and the sensor will move with the stars so you can do long-term exposures up to five minutes with your camera being stationary tracking stars. Now in practical application, uh, I have managed to get it to go up to two minutes. Um, without any kind of trailing or, or blurriness, motion blur. But two minutes is still a pretty long time, even at 100 ISO, to take a decent photo of a constellation or the Milky Way or even some um, planets or, or other stuff that exists in space like 
dark matter, I don't know, black holes. I don't, I don't know. What else do you photograph up there? Stuff that's up there, big things, because that's what we can see. Uh, so it works with the Astro Tracer unit, which is pretty spiffy, and um, yes. Later in this video, if you've seen my brief review about this video, I'm redoing the voiceover, and the, the, the voiceover is going to be the same later in this video, but the images are going to be changed. There will be some additional images, and including some that I'm going to take with the OGPS um, in, in three days. I haven't taken them yet, so I hope they turn out. If they don't, then there won't be those images. Either way, you'll find out. Maybe there will be some. There will at least be some with my K3 video. Those turned out. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> uh, back on onto the outline. I, I never, ever make a mistake going off outline. Oh boy. Um, so this camera has the ability to copy, uh, to embed copyright data into the image EXIF. So when this writes a JPEG or a RAW file, uh, JPEGs especially, uh, I, I don't know how to check it with a RAW file or if it exists, but with JPEGs at least, it creates an EXIF uh, aspect of the JPEG file, which has all kinds of data about the image, time it was taken, date, stuff like that. You can add your name and the copyright holder, whether it's you or someone else, to your EXIF data. You could also add the camera's serial number. There's a, a, few, a few lines two lines, I think, of available data for, for both the photographer and the copyright holder. It does, I think, also store the camera serial number in the EXIF data, but I can't remember for sure. Um, at any rate, that allows you, let's say your camera is stolen and you would like to prove that it's your camera, if you're able to find it, you can tell whomever has recovered it, just read the EXIF data. Take a picture and read the EXIF data, you'll see that my name is in it. Uh, also, the EXIF data storing, I believe it does store the serial number in it straight out of the box, which allows you to use online uh, stolen camera finders to comb through JPEGs posted to social media and image storing, public image storing uh, websites to match your serial number of your stolen camera with uploaded files so you can theoretically, if you're lucky, find the person who stole your camera that way. It's a very useful feature to be able to add your name and the copyright holder and also to have the exit data include the serial number. So one other special feature about this camera is that it does not have an anti-aliasing filter. Now anti-aliasing or AA filters, what they do is they serve to make fabric and other repeating patterns not have interference lines. And they do that by blurring the image. And it's a piece of glass that sits in front of the image sensor. By removing that piece of glass, now, granted, sometimes patterns can become, can look, can have interference lines in them, but you get a sharper image, which is important because you get more image quality and better detail. So this camera simulates the anti-aliasing filter by physically shaking the, the sensor at two different levels of simulation when you take a picture and you're, you want to have the AA filter on. On my K3 and on this camera, I just leave it off. And even though I've taken pictures of things with repeating patterns like clothes, I've honestly never noticed a problem. So, um, your best bet really is just to leave the AA filter off on, on these cameras to get the sharpest image. Unless you find that you absolutely have to have it. To, uh, to get a certain result that you want. Using the KS2, I felt like Pentax's engineers and designers watched my video on the KS1, took notes on everything about that camera that I disliked, removed all of those features, added everything that I said I wanted, and then added a whole bunch more to it as well. The result is the best entry-level DSLR that I have ever used. The KS2 is so clearly geared towards photographers that I cannot fathom how anyone who uses it truly uses it and gets to know it could ever settle for a lesser camera. The KS2 will spoil you for other camera brands. You will just demand too much from your camera.
The KS-2's capabilities are on par with the Pentax flagship K3. For buying the entry-level KS-2, all the photographer sacrifices are a second LCD and some slightly more convenient menu layouts. But that's not to, in any way, disparage the KS-2. This camera is so easy to learn, so capable of taking high-quality images, and so well-designed from a user interface perspective that it becomes an easy partner in capturing images. In the time that I had the KS-2, I took about 5,000 photos with it. These included astrophotography, sports and action, nature and landscapes, macros, and portraits. In every setting, the KS-2 did what I asked, better than I expected it to, and at the end of the shoot seemed to be looking up at me and thinking, wait, we're done already? The biggest, and for me the most important, improvement that Pentax made on the KS-2 is that this camera sips battery power. On a single battery's charge, I filled a 64 gigabyte memory card and still had one bar of battery power left. The ergonomics are a huge improvement too. It has some streamlined looks, but returns to a more classic and shapely Pentax form. The grip is marvelous. Everyone who I asked to hold the KS2, my fiance, random people, random people's kids, colleagues, they all said it felt fantastic in their hands. And people who were used to Nikon and Canon DSLRs, oh yeah, they preferred the way the KS2 felt in their hands over the Nikon and Canon bodies to which they were accustomed. This, I think, says more than any flowery accolade can. The other maker's users had camera envy. But Rico went beyond simply fixing all that ailed the KS-1. They made the KS-2 a stunning camera. The Wi-Fi by itself is a stupendous addition. Using the camera from my smartphone makes it a lot easier to get risky shots. For the nature photographer, this is a good way for you to get photos of a venomous snake or to get your camera up close to coyotes feasting on a roadkill deer. Paired with a suitable RC car chassis, the Wi-Fi feature allows you to take those high-risk nature photos that everyone loves and still go home without a scratch. But that's not all it's for. If you like taking photos of rally car races but don't really want to be hit if a car tumbles around a turn, well, the Wi-Fi allows you to take those photos from a safe distance. If you want to photograph a train as it passes and not risk being sucked under it or hit, the Wi-Fi allows you to do that. The Wi-Fi feature allows you to take the sort of gonzo photos you've dreamt of but have the good sense to avoid the risk of taking. But the Wi-Fi isn't just for high adrenaline photography. In real life, I work for a construction company. The Wi-Fi paired with a smartphone and data connection could allow high-resolution, highly detailed images of structural concerns, improper construction practices, against design construction, or safety issues to travel to a structural engineer, project manager, or safety officer a mile or ten time zones away. You can take high-grade photos of your son or daughter scoring a soccer goal and then share the best photos anyone in the stands are taking on Facebook and do it almost as fast as the people who are taking photos with their smartphones. A doctor could take a detailed macro photo or multiple detailed photos of a patient's medical issues and email them immediately to an expert in another state or country, all without interrupting the rest of their appointment with that patient. The Wi-Fi feature on this camera has so many beneficial and creative uses as to defy easy quantification. If you get this camera, you will find a way to use the Wi-Fi and it will make your experience with this camera better. Is the Wi-Fi perfect? No, not at all. My wish list for a firmware update is that in the future, the Wi-Fi app could control any shooting mode, including video. Right now, it only controls single frame shooting. I'd like it if the Wi-Fi app could control multiple bodies at once, but insofar as I know, 
having only had one KS2 to test, the app can probably only control one camera at a time. Or it would be great if Rico added some of those features to the Wi-Fi control only for the APS-C flagships and future full frame lineup. That would be fine too. Pentax always wades into the pool before they perform a high dive. They can eke more out of the Wi-Fi and I believe they will. So who is the KS2's target audience? It's geared toward the entry-level market, but it has all the bells and whistles that will keep intermediate, advanced, and even professional users happy. Sure, it lacks a few of the interface elements of the K3 and K3 II, but it lacks no functionality. From a functional perspective, the KS2 is the K3's peer in every regard. That approach to camera making differentiates a Pentax entry-level body from an any other camera maker's entry-level body. Pentax, more accurately Rico, provide for their users a pathway to grow with their cameras and, in time, to graduate to a more advanced body without it being a huge learning curve every time they step up. In no other maker is there as much care directed toward the user experience as with Ricoh's Pentax camera lineup. And to everyone who loves Pentax and hates Ricoh, that's rather akin to loving beer and hating wheat. Ricoh, under the Pentax badge, is making the best and most exciting cameras on the market today. The KS2 is a prime example, very possibly at the top of that exciting camera list. But here's the bottom line. If you buy a KS2 today, will it grow with you as a photographer? Yes, easily and as far as you want to go with it. In fact, if you really take your time to learn everything that your KS2 can do, you will find that it can teach you new tricks. Your KS2 will lead you into areas of creative photography into which you had never ventured. Your KS2 could, in fact, make you a better photographer as long as you have the creative vision to support your KS2. And that's something that I've never said about any camera ever before. So, a couple of things not to do with your camera. First off, don't touch the mirror. When you take off the lens, you can see a mirror in there. Don't touch it. Uh, don't touch the sensor with your finger. That's a good way to leave a fingerprint on it, which will cause blurriness in all of your photos for the rest of time. You should not do that at all. Uh, don't touch the shutter, because if the shutter closes or opens with your finger on there, or if you get oils on, on the shutter from your finger, that can ruin it. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because they will get heat or cold damage. Either the oils in your camera or the lens will get thin and get onto moving parts of the camera that they're not supposed to or the sensor. And that can uh, ruin your image quality and more importantly ruin your gear. Likewise, if they get cold and freeze, um, then the lubricating oils can break down and become gummy and things won't work the way they're supposed to. Don't store your gear in a plastic bag or box because moisture will get into it and it will fungus will at some point grow on your lenses or on parts of your camera. And that's a really good way to ruin a lens and make a camera smell disgusting. I've gotten a couple mildewy cameras in my life and oh, whoa, man, opening that box from the eBay guy with that mildewy camera where the mold was growing underneath the camera. Oh my goodness. Oh. So just don't, just don't store them in a cat, plastic camera or bo uh, bag or box. I actually do, I keep mine in a Pelican case, but I also have a fresh desiccant, a rechargeable desiccant, and that's an okay solution, but you need to have a good, um, too strong, <laughs> like too large, an oversized desiccant pack that you can recharge regularly um, if you're gonna keep it inside of a closed plastic container. Don't let your camera get wet. now. That's true to a point that you, this is weather sealed. So if you're out in the drizzle or fog or a sandstorm, light sandstorm, um, you're fine. 
if you're out in a tornado, uh, it's going to get interesting. There's a, I saw an interesting test where somebody had taken one of these KS2s and stood in a fountain for half an hour. One of these fountains where the water's coming in and splashing down on you. And the model was completely soaked and the camera was completely fine. There was some water on the outside of it. They dried it off and they just kept on shooting. And that was with the KS2. So the weather sealing on these is really very effective and uh, really good. So so I've, I've taken, I took this out to the ocean. I took, a, I took one of the KS2s out to the ocean. No problem. Salt water spray, not a, not a big deal at all. Just cleaned it off the outside of the camera and went on. Uh, just remember, your Pentax KS2 is a precision tool and it should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. So now I'd, I'd like to invite you to leave me a thumbs up if this video was helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those below. I'm pretty good about responding fairly quickly. If you have any thoughts uh, or suggestions for future videos, please let me know. In fact, a lot of what my videos are like today is directly because of questions you've asked and suggestions you've made over time, for which I'm very appreciative. And one last thing, Thank you guys for watching and take great photos. Where was it? Okay. Cheever. Cheever. Hey, big guy. I love you too. You're my good puppy. Yes, I know. It's a gorgeous day outside. And you're getting none of it. I'm sorry. Okay, after this video, we'll go for a quick stroll, okay? Okay, but you gotta let me finish the video, puppy, okay? Yes, I, Cheever, Cheever, you're knocking my, you're, you're, gonna, you're going to break the lamps. Cheever, puppy, I love you too. Go lie down. Okay, yes, you can give me a kiss. Okay, good boy. Go lie down, puppy, okay? Go on, let me finish this video, then we'll go for a stroll.